Awesome. All right. I think in the, in the next few seconds, we're going to see participant number going up as people are starting to roll into the webinar. Um, so here's how we're going to do this. We're going to keep this pretty, uh, pretty simple. Um, we're going to start with a, a small intro so people know, again, and are re-reminded who the hell we are and why we care and we know a thing or two about data in the sales process and how uh, using data in the sales process can accelerate it for you. So we're gonna do a, a quick round of intros, uh, then we're go, gonna go into the, the panel. And uh, during the entire time, as, as the participants are coming in, uh, during the entire time of the panel, if you guys have questions, uh, there's a beautiful little Q&A button. You click that, you down your question. That way it's ensured that we're gonna see it. And at the kind of the, the, the last part of the webinar, we're gonna do an extensive Q&A going through all the questions, trying to answer as many as possible. You can always use chat to ask us questions if you want us not to answer them, because we're not gonna see it. People are chatting away quite crazily. There's no way for us to go back in chat and kind of skim through it and find your questions. So if you have questions, whenever you have questions, click the Q&A button in Zoom, write it down, we're gonna address it at the end of the webinar. All right, so let's get going with the introductions before we jump into the panel. First of all, I'm gonna introduce uh, the beautiful face that's not that animated uh, with the name Ryan Robinson. You see like one, one of the four of us is just an image enabled. Ryan is the mastermind behind the webinar series. So he made sure that Brennan and Will and myself made it in time in the panel that we're prepared, invited everybody to join the webinar. So he's kind of running the webinar series for us at close. And he's going to be moderating the Q&A section at the end of the webinar, um, where he is going to come to life, I assume, and, and start streaming video. Um, so that's the, the Ryan intro. Um, Will, why don't you tell us, and, and Ryan right now is in Palo Alto, I think. He's in the Bay Area. So Will, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, why you care about data, how it is relevant to you, and where in the world you are. Um, to kick us off. Thanks, Sally. So my name is Will. I, I head up half of the small and mid-sized new business team for Zoom Info. Um, really excited to be able to join today. We are in Waltham, Massachusetts, about eight miles outside of Boston. Um, and I, I care about these types of things, especially as a part of a company like Zoom that's growing right now, because I'm pretty obsessed with helping my customers achieve growth goals and not have to wait for two, three, four years from now, but figure out why they can't achieve them tomorrow. And we know that data is at the core of that and you know, using analytics and understanding how to have insights into data that's available. We know our customers are achieving their growth goals in you know, fractions of the time that they thought they could. So that's why I'm excited to chat with you guys. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Will. Brennan, you're next. Uh, who are you? Why do you care about data? And where in the world are you right now? Because it's always interesting. <laughs> so right, right now I'm in Columbus, Ohio. I'm here for a wedding. First time here. Uh, but my name is Brennan Dunn. I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders of Right Message. And like, like all of us, I'm really obsessed over uh, data, specifically data you can act on. So one of the things we've been really focused on is helping people make it so the content people see, whether it be on-site messaging, testimonials, email communication, whatever, uh, is able to individually resonate with people on the receiving end. So, you know, we've, uh, my background's in sales and I know that the best performing salespeople deviate from the script to use examples based off of who is this person, what do I know about them, how are they behaving and so on. And what we're trying to do is help that basically be possible at scale um, in, in a one-to-many way. Sweet. Awesome. So a little bit about myself uh, to round up the, the intro section. Um, my name is Sally FT. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Close.io, which is an inside sales CRM. So our kind of unique positioning in the market is that we're really powerful communication tools. So if you do a lot of email communication, if you do a lot of call and communication, we build a very, very strong piece of software that allows your team to close more deals and make more sales. But we are CRM at the core, which means that we collect a ton of data, right? And we want to show our users the right data at the right time and data that's actionable. Brandon, you brought this up before, and that actually leads to outcomes. Um, so I really, really care about 
the data point selfishly, you know, from a, from a, you know, this is the type of business that we're building, but also from the other side of like just get, helping founders and helping startups. Um, there is hundreds of emails in my inbox every single week and a lot of smaller teams and newer companies, especially are a little overwhelmed when it comes to how do we use it? We all know we need to use data. We all agree. But how the fuck do we do this? Like, how the hell do we actually do it? What tools do we use? What methodologies, what processes? So I really want to break this down, make this super actionable so that the people that are listening to us uh, today uh, can take, you know, things and put them in practice right away today, tomorrow, and really start seeing results. And it's not just like an aspirational webinar. It's like one day when we're big enough, we could do some cool stuff with data as well. Um, so I'm super psyched to talk to you guys about, about this stuff, and you both are real experts in it. Um, I'm actually right now in Scotland, in Edinburgh, uh, of all places. It, it, it just came here from Greece from a sailing trip, and it could not be a bigger cultural shock. It's raining outside right now, <laughs> and it's sort of kind of cold. What you would expect probably from Scotland. I didn't think about it too deeply before I came here. Um, and, but it's also awesome to see in the chat already see, uh, saw a bunch of people from all around the world uh, logging in and checking in. For all of you that are concerned about this or are wondering, we are recording the webinar. So if at any time you want to rewatch this or rewatch certain bits, you can. If you want to share it with team members or other people that you know, you can. You're going to get an email in your inbox since you've registered to the webinar. Don't worry about you know, every single word. We're going to send you a beautiful recording for you to watch afterwards. And uh, with that being said, a last reminder again, Q&A button. You're going to get as much out of this webinar as you uh, participate, right? Um, we, we'll, we'll try to hit some, some great notes and entertain you, but you're going to get real value out of it if you tell us your specific use case, your specific challenges, and the things that really interest you most. And we're going to get to that in the probably the most valuable part of the entire webinar, which is going to be the Q&A section. So hit the Q&A button at any time as you're listening to us. Write down your question, and we're going to get to all of those questions at the end of the webinar. Boom. All right. With that, the intro is out of the way. So let's jump right into it, right? So, and here's the, the, the question I'd love for us to start with. Um, you know, the, the thing that I really would like to start with, before we get to the to-dos, let's, uh, let's look at some of the not-to-dos, right? Um, Brennan, Will, both of you have worked with many companies. Both of you have used very different data sets and data technologies and, and products to, to improve the sales process. From your experience, personal as well as from the, the companies and the, the teams that you've advised, what are some of the biggest mistakes that teams make today still when it comes to either using data or not using data? The things that really make you pull your hair out, the things that make you like and not be able to sleep well at night that makes you go, I can't believe that people still do this every single day today. Like biggest mistakes when it comes to not using data or using data in the wrong way uh, when it comes to selling. Who wants to go first? I'll go ahead. Um, I think what we find is that so many companies when they get started, they all have such brilliant ideas. They have brilliant values and solutions and benefits, and they need to tell the world about them. Um, but quite often, one of the mistakes that we make is they're unsure and uncertain and almost hesitant and reticent to even tell everybody about their brand because they don't want to worry that they're spraying and praying, right? Um, you know, I don't want to send a solution that's relevant to sales and marketing people necessarily to a finance person, right? But the important thing is, is that you know, by not telling more people about your message, you're hindering your ability to hear about your brand, talk about your brand, generate buzz about your brand, engage on social with your brand, engage with content about your brand. And so oftentimes when I see a startup with this brilliant solution, the, the, the thing that I don't, doesn't make me cringe, but definitely helps me, you know, maybe think about trying to help them out is say, oh, I only want to go after the people that are going to buy my product. And that's kind of like saying, I only want to date someone that's going to marry me, right? It, it doesn't really work that way. Um, and so we have ways to help folks get through that, but we'll stick with what not to do is to answer your question for now. But that's one of them that we see for sure. Yeah. One of the biggest, so I, um, we recently just did a survey to our list trying to figure out how do people currently segment? How do they collect data? What data do they collect and how do they collect it? And the biggest shock, I think, I don't think it was really a shock, but it was when you really see the numbers in person, is just how few companies, especially, I mean, even big companies, 
how few companies actually segment their audience in, an, in a meaningful way. Um, the majority of people do segment off of customer versus non-customer. Beyond that, um, a lot of companies are in the dark about who their customers are, who their audience is, uh, what needs do they have, how do they identify demographically or firmographically. So I just think there, there's a lot of, I think the biggest uh, reason for that is people don't know what they would do that, with that data um, and they don't know how to collect it. So I think the biggest, uh, the biggest, I think, issue that I see is, you know, offline, uh, we, everyone takes in, that into account. If I'm at a conference for, so, you know, Steli, I think you're at um, TurnConf or whatever it is, right? In Edinburgh? Yeah. So um, I think that's a lot of data scientist type people and everything else. So when you're talking about, you know, close to them, you, you automatically kind of bias what you're saying based off the fact that if somebody's at this conference, what can I probably tell about them and how I can best communicate what I do and, and why it's beneficial for them um, off that. So I, I just don't see, I see a lot of people who take this kind of newsletter broadcast base, like send the same exact wording and language to everyone at the same exact time. And it's just fundamentally opposed to the way things work offline. So um, yeah, I, I think the biggest mistake would, would lie with, the lack of actual and proper segmentation. I love that. Um, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll jab on that note a little bit because the biggest mistake that I see um, is when it comes to data, and this really is a, a problem in many other areas in way that companies are trying to approach, you know, approach improving what they're doing is that they lie on one end of the extremes of the, 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 the spectrum. Either they don't do anything, right, and they have zero data. And the reason why they are in that end of the spectrum oftentimes is because the other option they see is the other extreme, which is like investing the next 18 months <laughs> exclusively in collecting data, setting a data model, uh, you know, selecting a business intelligence dashboard and like having the entire company work on, you know, building the best data models ever for a business that has uh, three customers, right? Um, yeah. Each paying $29 a month, right? So, so I, I think that most of the time when, when companies think about how do we approach using data more in a more sophisticated manner for a marketing and sales team to acquire more customers and better customers, they think way too complex. Like they think, you know, a thousand steps ahead and that either overwhelms them so much that they're like, well, F this, let's just keep doing it the way we've been doing it. Or uh, I don't even know what's worse, probably the second one, or they're not overwhelmed by that option and they're going off, you know, down this like weird chase of building something that's way over engineered and that they will not use or not make good use of because they built something way too complex for the stage that their company is in and what they truly can use, right? What's what is data that we, that we can actually make decisions based on and take actions based on versus just nice to have, oh, now we know X is this percentage. Now what? <laughs> what do we do with this knowledge, right? So I think with segmentation, it's a, it's a beautiful example because you go from, well, first of all, even companies that think they don't have segmentation have it, which, which is the customers, non-customers, right? That's a form of segmentation. And now why don't you just add one or two layers to this to begin with, right? Not a thousand, right? Just like one. Like let's, let's make this just a little bit better than what it is right now. Not yet perfect, but better and actionable so it improves the results that your sales team is able to drive. And I think that that what drives me crazy is when what I see too often is that teams are at one end of the spectrum. Either they are, they don't do anything, even the simple things, or they're trying to do something that's way too complex, way over-engineered, and will have zero value and waste a ton of time. And I think the right approach, just like with product development, is to take baby steps, just improvements, month over month, quarter over quarter. Let's just improve one thing. Let's add one thing. Let's uh, work on one thing at a time that's going to be actionable right now, useful and valuable right now to the team. The most valuable thing comes next, right? So with that being said, let's jump right into some of the juicy stuff that, <laughs> that the audience probably wants to hear, right? So I guarantee you a large portion of, of uh, the webinar attendees um, are going to think, all right, data, data and sales, 
prospecting, right? How do I get better lead lists? How do I segment my lead lists better? How do I use data to do outreach? How do I customize my, my outreach at scale? Like, how do, I make, how do we make our sales outbound prospecting process better by using data today? What tools, methodologies, what tips, what tricks do you guys have? Will, I know that you work at a company that I would assume a lot of sales teams are using as a starting point for a bunch of their, their, their outbound prospecting. So tell us a little bit about you know, what, what, how teams and sales teams and salespeople today, how they should use data and the tools that are available to improve on what they're doing, especially when it comes to prospecting and, and the lead gen part of the sales. Sure. Yeah. So you know, any amazing solution, any amazing tool, uh, not used properly still won't yield results too, right? So, you know, we know that we have a pretty objectively valuable solution that our customers love and, you know, they compare us side by side all the time and, and they see that our data, you know, has a ton of merit and a ton of value. But what we recommend, whether it's Zoom Info or our competitors or whomever else is, is take a top-down approach, right? You have to address who potentially could, your message resonate with and who would potentially be people you want to drive to your website through all your inbound and outbound or, you know, efforts. What type of functions are those, right? Not just your buyer titles. Then you have to think about what types of companies are we really focused on nailing it with right now? Do we do kind of case studies or proofs of concept or initial customer pilots before we got our first funding round or before we all gathered up and decided to make this thing a company that we had as an idea around the dinner table, right? So then they segment their, database their audience, I should say, into certain pockets. You know, you're going to work this audience, you're going to work this audience, you're going to work this audience. And then they measure results, right? And they say, we can attribute these results to this type of account that has this amount of revenue, this amount of headcount, this type of vertical. And here's the results from the others, right? Once they have analysis on what types of the market respond to what types of messaging and who their buyers are turning into, then they capitalize and they pounce. And that's where solutions like ZoomInfo really assist our customers scale because like any static set of data, once you get through it, you're out of it. Whereas with ours um, and our customers are using a lot of different data sources often, right? But it's important that you never run out of who you're going for. If you kill it in the SMB space with companies in the software industry, less than $50 million in revenue, and you kill it with marketing folks that are trying to scale their org, if you kill it with the first 10,000, you need to go find another 50,000 tomorrow, right? Because otherwise you're going to take three more years to find other people to, tar to target and go after. You're going to ask for referrals and momentum slows down. And we all know that what, what happens there. Um, and, and that's where a solution like ZoomInfo that's ever flowing and constantly updating and growing and refreshing really adds value to our customers because we can help you now 30, 90, 60, you know, uh, 180, excuse me, days from now and way, way beyond. So and that's where we recommend people start is figure out your scope, segment, you know, what your scope could be, measure, measure results, go back and remeasure, hypothesize, test, hypothesize, test, and then be able to expand on your wins with, with pretty actionable understanding of where the wins came from. Brennan, what are some of the, the ways that you've seen uh, salespeople, sales teams, marketing teams as well on the acquisition side of things use data on the, especially at the beginning, prospecting, lead gen, getting that first, doing that first step of outreach, having that first connection and communication, like what, what do teams need to do today to really utilize and take advantage of the data and the data sets that are out there to improve on those results? Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, the ideal would be a fully personal, fully, you know, written from scratch almost uh, outreach email, right? Problem is that doesn't scale very well. If I'm, if I've got a thousand people I'm reaching out to, I can't afford to go in and go and, and write a, a custom email, you know, for each, right? And then get them on follow-up sequences and everything else. So what I've seen and what, a, you know, a lot of our customers, for instance, have done is when you're using data like from ZoomInfo or, you know, some sort of enriched data that has things like the industry somebody's in, their job role, uh, company size, whatever, leveraging that data to make it so that initial, that, that initial volley of outreach is immediately more relevant to them because people are inundated with data or not data, but messages, right? And they want to not need to sift through the crap. They want to see specifically, you know, if I send you an email, how can this benefit you? So the best thing I think you can do from like the get go is 
if you're reaching out to say a marketer who works for a nonprofit and you know this because you know the, the lead you're happening to send an email to fits those two different segments, right? Uh, business type equals nonprofit, role equals marketer. Um, by making it so you off the bat speak their language, you reference things that they're, you know, people in that industry and, and nonprofits care about, maybe include some social proof about, you know, somebody else you've helped in their space, just show that you get who they are, you understand that domain, you, um, and, and ideally you have a, a way of helping them. That's, that's the thing that increases, you know, in my mind, it's, it's the more relevant a message is, the more likely they are to continue to engage with it, right? So we all get cold emails. I get cold emails all the time from these people who obviously I'm getting, I'm on the receiving end of something that a lot of people are getting and they put no thought into who I am or anything like that. That immediately gets archived. But the ones that are more targeted, I'm more likely to read. And, and you know, the goal of good copy is to get somebody to read the next line, right? So um, the more that I think you can tailor, especially that initial message that initial email you send somebody um and usually it doesn't need to be hard whether it's you just say look this you know i've got a lead list of a thousand people this is a hundred people who uh, fit this kind of persona or fit this sort of you know segment um i'm going to say this to them and then i'm going to do this the next batch and so on um that's one way obviously a more uh scalar way would be to make it so you have some sort of templating conditional templating that says if this is true, use this, otherwise say that. Um, and then you could potentially just keep getting, you know, potentially continuous feed of, uh, you know, contact records that are enriched with this metadata that you can then pivot off of. You can say, you know, if industry equals X, spit this out, else if industry equals Y, say this and so on. And really almost Mad Lib style uh, do outreach as a way of basically just getting people to realize, okay, this, you know, they obviously know a bit about who I am and they're making it so um, what they're trying to say aligns directly with my needs. So that's the kind of thing, I mean, that's, that's the beginning of, of uh, generally when we're talking with people about how, you know, whether they're doing cold outreach or they're doing, um, you know, uh, targeted ad campaigns to their site or whatever else, uh, things like that where you're just better aligning what you have to say with what somebody, somebody's needs are based off of, presumably who they are. Love that. Um, all right, I saw that uh, a few participants were raising their hand. I wasn't even aware of that uh, functionality in Zoom. Uh, for those that have the urge to ask a question, I applaud you. I've mentioned this before, but I'll keep mentioning it. There's a little button in Zoom with the, word, uh, the, the letter Q and A. You click that, please write down, yes, Chris, I see you. Please write, click the Q&A button, write your question out, and at the, towards the end of the webinar, we're going to go through all the questions that we're going to address your question at that point. Um, appreciate it. Uh, uh, again, you know, the more questions you guys ask, the more, personal, the more personalized the knowledge that we're sharing, the higher the chance that this uh, webinar is going to be worth your while and worth your time. So take advantage of it and ask as many questions as you need to really get value out of this session. All right. Um, with that being said, so we, we you know, there, there's multiple um, effects to data, right? One, one way that salespeople, I'll take the maybe less sophisticated salesperson perspective here, since it's easy for me to do that, and say, you know, when I think about data, here's what I think about. Give me a list of people's names, you know, and contact information so I can call or email them and they can purchase from me, right? That's the first kind of step and layer that I think about. Then maybe, you know, uh, maybe I'll think, okay, if we want to improve on this massive list, maybe we'll do some segmentation. You know, let's put them in buckets who are really big corporations or mid-sized corporations or small businesses who are people in certain positions, management positions, like whatever it is, right? I might think about seg segmenting that list. So, but why do I want to segment the list? You know, mostly for two basic reasons. One, I want to customize my message which is a thing that Brennan, uh, you're a huge expert in and you've built a tool around, right? How do I, how can I say the right thing in front of the right person, right? Um, but then the, and the flip side is segmenting or the other side of uh, the reason why I would want to segment as a salesperson is so that I have a better idea of the kind of results I can drive with different groups of people, right? Uh, do, you know, these types of size business respond more to email or more to calls? Do this type of 
position respond more to my messaging than another type of person within the organization, uh, within the same organization in a different position. I, in order to have some kind of a sanity of what is working and what isn't working, I, I need to look not just at the results, but the results to some level of segmentation, which is another thing why a lot of sales teams have problems with uh, improving on their results is because their results are all over the place. <laughs> because what they're doing is all over the place in terms of they don't segment at all. Um, and then there's a, a, a you know, customization uh, component, right? Maybe I know something about you uh, based on what you have shared on social media, or based on what you're sharing online and publicly, based on what you have clicked or what you've done in my application or on my website. Um, and then there's a timing component, which is an interesting one. I don't know if we'll get to that, but it's the, you know, not just are you potentially interested, but are you interested right now, right? And there's tools out there I'll just throw out one with uh, uh, Data Nice, for instance, that can tell you that here's some here's the type of prospects that are currently using a competitor product, and they know that because they scroll a bunch of sites and they notice when somebody's using some uh, you know some some little widget or some little tool or some snippet in their code, right? Oh, this site just started using Google Analytics. If I have an analytics product, I might want to reach out to that company and go, hey, Google Analytics is cool, but we have a better analytics product for you, right? So it can tell me something not just about the prospect in general, but specifically about the timing of what that company is doing right now, maybe trialing a product or implementing a competitor's piece of software. So all these things, if I know them, if I'm able to use them, hopefully they help me sell more and sell better, right? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about these different components, right? Uh, Brandon, I would love really to talk to have you break down a little bit the customization piece because the thing that a lot of people might not know about you, but I know because we've known each other for a really long time is that you were doing really funky, really interesting and really customized personalization stuff for your blog way before you build a tool. Right? Yeah, back, you were back in 2012, doing, I started. <laughs> right, in 2012. Yeah. And, and you, had a, you had a project management tool, a time tracking tool for freelancers. You had you know, an, an online education a, a business. Like you had all sorts of businesses, and you built all these customizations because you wanted to convert more customers. And today, you have a product that's based on, on a bunch of those learnings. But uh, you've come a really long way. And I remember talking to you, I don't know when, 20, you know, a, a bunch of years ago. And you tell me some of the funky stuff that you were doing just for your site. And I was like, mind blown by that. So <laughs> I, I'd, love, I'd love for you to share, you know, some of the things that you had tried in the past, some of the things that you learned. And like when, it, especially when it comes to customization, how salespeople can use customization today in ways that seem magical to the recipient, but actually are pretty basic and they could use software tools or some basic steps to, to really improve the results that they're getting. Yeah. So the biggest thing, or the thing that I started with, I should say, is um, I, you mentioned the project management tool plan scope that I used to have back in 2012. I thought, you know, I did the typical content marketing thing. I had a blog that had articles related to the product uh, or, or tangentially related to the type of person who would use the product. And the first thing I started doing in terms of customization was saying, if they're already on my list, don't get show an opt-in. Show, show call to action to get them to sign up for the product. And if they've already signed up for the product, don't show anything. And that was it, right? I mean, it sounds revolutionary, but you know, even to this day, you see a lot. I, I get a newsletter from a company, I click through, and I'm hit with like a pop-up asking for my email. Um, there's all this stuff trying to get my email, and I'm like, you just emailed me. Why are you, why are you showing me this? So I think for, for companies, especially content-focused companies that are doing a lot of um, things where they're bringing people back to their website. And I know for kind of high-touch sales companies, the sale might happen over the phone or over email or something like that. But th the website probably has some role outside of just lead gen, whether you're sending your weekly newsletter or something like that. You're bringing people back to your site. They're, you're nurturing them more, right? Um, and so the the thing that I would encourage people to start with is the natural segmentation you already have. Are they a lead or are they anonymous? And that's it, right? So if they're anonymous, get them to become a lead. If they're already a lead, get them to buy. And then you can go a step further and say, well, if they buy from me, I'm going to go into my CRM and mark, you know, annotate them as such, tag them or something like that, and then have my you know, website communicate with my CRM. And I know that sounds complicated, but our software does do that. Um, and then if they've already bought from us, well, 
show the next thing, show the, the upsell, show something else. So that's kind of the vertical based customization that I started with. It's what I've done for the last six years or so. And that tends to have really good performance because if you think about it, most people optimize for anonymous traffic. You go to any site on the internet, lead forms, trying to get you to opt in, whatever. But then if you're already a customer, if you're already on their list in some way, you're already a lead, you're still hit with the same call to actions. And most sites do this, but it's really a missed opportunity. And on top of that, it's bad user experience, right? If I'm already on your list, don't inundate me with pop-ups trying to get me on, on, you know, to fill out a lead form. So that's the first thing. I, I think it would be that kind of vertical uh, based way of depending on where somebody's in, in your buying cycle, having different offers, different call to actions that reflect where they are and where they should be next. So anonymous, get them on, get them to become a lead, lead, get them to buy, customer, get them to become a super customer or whatever. Um, and then the other thing would be horizontal uh, customizations. So that would be things like what industry are they in? What uh, role do they have at a company? Uh, what need do they have from you? Like why, why are they looking for CRM software? Maybe they are sick of a competitor. Maybe they uh, don't have a CRM currently. And tailoring then the way that you position your offer, the position your business or the product, I should say, based on, you know, one of those elements. So I see it as kind of this two, two, two step way. And like you said, it's at the beginning, it's easy to look at this and be, Oh my, to think, Oh my God, this is a shitload of like, <laughs> where do I even start? Right. Um, but I started out just by saying, look, if they're on my list, don't show them the product. And if they're off my list, get them to go on my list. And I started from that and I added complexity over time. But what I'm seeing and what we're seeing is by combining where they're in the buying cycle, along with what they need or who they are, that's the stuff that's replicating a lot of what works offline. You know, if I'm a salesperson, you come back to me, you're already a customer. I don't need to convince you that we're the real deal. You already know that you're already a customer. I need to convince you of what you should be doing next. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's the thing that I think, you know, in terms of customization, what I would start with would be, you know, the natural segments you already have, uh, anonymous or lead, uh, anonymous lead customer, you know, something like that. Start from there and then scale in complexity over time. And I, I think too, I, I think too, it's really important. Like there's a lot of planning and thought process and calculation that goes into making sure you're executing the right outreach. Right. And, and I think of prospecting, prospecting really comes from a term. If you think about it, when people headed West and went to where their gold, there was gold. Right. So like, but the, the, even though they knew there was gold in the area, they had to start digging. And that's where data really comes back into play here is all the planning and hypothesizing stuff aside you know, it's super important when you get started that the phrase is we're, we're small and we need to start small isn't true, right? Like if you think your value is really, really important for a certain type of person, you need to get your hands on information about those people. You need a ton of at bats because I always say this to my team, right? You're going to learn how to win by failing because if you show up and try to win every single day and you don't know what people say to you or what they hear or what they want to hear or what they're trying to accomplish and you're not having conversations, then you're just you're just kind of cleaning your desk all day and not really ever having some type of productive conversation. And what we find is, you know, our customers are having a conversation one out of every five attempts, right? Whereas in most people, when they're first prospecting, it takes 20 attempts to get anybody on the phone and they're usually a secretary, right? They're usually not the person that you could even sell your wares to or tell your wares about where it would make sense. And so that's what's also really important is all the calculation, all the hypothesizing, all the segmenting of certain messaging if, you know, it's the tree in the forest thing, right? If, you, if they're not hearing you and you're not actually getting in touch with people, the prospecting just becomes research, time wasted, time lost, revenue not gained, experiments not performed, hypotheses not tested, and then that's what stalls scalability as well, right? And I think that's what's really important when it comes to prospecting. Before you actually pick the phone up, you got to make sure you have people to call. You got to make sure you have information that gets you a live connect. I love that. Let me double click on that real quick. Um, the one thing that I tell people all the time, uh, there, there used to be, you know, when social media started to become a thing that people talked about as like this new phenomenon, people were like, this is going to change sales forever. And, you know, how do you think about social selling as if there was a, an anti-social selling ever that existed, right? Like all selling is to a certain degree social if it's a human to human interaction. If you're like, well, how much research should I do this, that, and the other? And I always told people, you know, obviously it makes sense to use publicly available information about your prospect 
you know, do a little bit of homework so you're prepared when you talk to people. But a lot of times you can overdo that. And instead of preparing, what you're doing is you're stalling. You're actually just like avoiding the, you're picking up the phone and calling or sending the email or having the real conversation. You can't be researching somebody for three hours, you know, uh, uh, that you have a first conversation with, especially if we talk about an SMB deal that might be worth a hundred bucks a month or 200 bucks a month. But what are you doing three hours reading somebody's Twitter statuses, you know, from when they were 16 all the way up to their forties <laughs> today? Like that makes no sense. And then the other problem is that I think, especially on the one, on the individual, like you having data as a salesperson coming into the conversation, into a meeting about the company or about the individuals that are, that are um, included in the conference call, whatever it is, it, that, that data can be really, really valuable, but you need to be very, very careful how you use it. And you should always first confirm that that data is correct before you use it, right? Because the problem with humans is when we know so much about something, we want to show it off, right? We want to come into the conversation and impress everyone. Ta-da! Look at everything I know about you. The problem with that is the, the chance of you, you know, making some bad calls or having made some bad interpretations uh, are very, very high. And even if you don't, you're not going to impress me with my life. I already know myself. Like, there's no, nothing you're going to tell me that you know already about me will make me impressed, right? So... People need to be careful. And, and I've seen this all the time where salespeople put their foot in the mouth when they're like, ha, huh, I'm also a huge fan of Team XYZ. And then it turns out the person isn't really that big of a fan of Team XYZ. They lost the bet. They actually hate that team, but they had for a week to tweet every day how much they love the team. Like, just little things. So you want to make use of the data, but you want to use as a primary tool the conversation, the interaction, the communication to reconfirm yes. You know, there's a pattern. And since I know X, Y, and Z about them, and they're now reconfirming these other things, now this gives me the full picture to truly understand the customer and to say the right things and to act in a way that's really relevant for them and that's going to move the deal forward. All right, I want to say, want to touch on, uh, Will, you wanted to comment on that. Let's do no, it. please. I was just going to say, because I know that Close.io's customers are super tactical in their outreach, right? They, they really need to make sure that they're informed and they need to, you know, the other thing about information is it's okay to keep that information in your mind and just use it as a, as a chip, right? Like if I think a company might be a customer of SAP, I don't need to go in and say, Hey, cause you're using SAP. I'm calling you. Right? <laughs> like that doesn't work. Or the same thing. Like if I'm going to measure results and reach out to three different segments, I'm not going to say because you're in the software industry, I think this should be relevant for you. Right? Like insight is so valuable to stay internal and then measure results that come back. So when you have data, you're leveraging that information about the data that you used at the front end. But that's, the, that's another tactical problem that I see with a lot of salespeople is they go in and they kind of blurt out the, the punchline of the story before they even figure out, you know, what are your, what are your reactions to my value position? And yeah. I think that's where, you know, talking to Ryan the other day, like that, that's, that's, I know that your customers think that way. And I think that's so important to be, to be super calculated, but not, not too outward about the insights that you already have, right? So data helps that way. Yeah, I've always thought- I love that. I prefer more like soft, soft customization in the sense of, you know, instead of saying like, hey, Steli, how's the weather in San Francisco when you're <laughs> not in San Francisco right now? Right. Um, even though some like social profile might have you listed there, right? Um, that is more damaging than not saying anything at all, right? Mm -hmm. not, not saying any th sort of custom thing. So, I found like if they're in a certain industry or you think they're in a certain industry, and this is where I think like segment scoring should actually be a, a thing where you have some confidence level of them being in a certain segment or not. If they tell you, Hey, I'm in you know, retail, then they're probably in retail. But if, if some, you know, data source says they're in retail, well, maybe, maybe they're not. Um, but by doing things like changing, doing soft changes, like maybe showing a few case studies of retail companies instead of overtly saying, you know, as a retail company owner, you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, that could that could backfire if that data is incorrect. So yeah, I think they're depending on the the trustworthiness of that underlying data. Um, yeah, you should you should change your message based off that, whether it's in person or over the phone, or you know at scale on your website, for instance. 
I love that. I, I'm glad that we hinted on that. And yes, data, you can use data to creep prospects out, right? Um, yeah. Especially especially salespeople, right? Oh, I'm calling you because I saw you open my email and 33 people in your organization clicked on the PDF. <laughs> so you are obviously very interested. And it's like, no. Yeah. And, you know, well, this, is, this is not going to make me like you. It would feel like this is a customized conversation. This person understands me, right? So the, the part of like using insights to inform actions and to enrich with context how you interpret what the prospect is doing is very valuable. But using data to hammer people and like kick in the door with all your knowledge of everything they've done, um, that usually leads to either people not liking you or even more worse, uh, using completely wrong things because data can be wrong. The, the data you scrape, the click that, that the, the software counted as 33 clicks might have been something completely different, right? So you need to be really careful with that. All right. So we are getting into the Q&A session of the webinar. I, I, we, I saw we already have 13 really killer questions. And for people that are in the webinar, you can still ask questions while we're going through it. I'm, as I, I mentioned earlier, I'm in Scotland. I'm in Turing Fest. It's a big conference. I have obligations and places to be and hands to shake and talks to give. So I'm going to leave you in the really capable hands of Ryan, who's going to be emceeing the Q&A section. Brennan and Will, you guys have still been so far. If somebody has a question about my two boys or something only I could answer specifically, Ryan is going to make sure that I answer that question by email. So every question is going to get answered. But I'm going to say bye at this section. I'm going to give the MC mic over to Ryan, who's going to host the Q&A section of the webinar. This was a blast. Thank you so much, guys. And I'll see you very, very soon. Thanks, Kelly. Have a blast. All right, guys. So we've seen uh, several really good questions that actually come in already. Um, so please keep them coming. We've gotten about another 20 minutes here um, to get your questions answered by Will and Brennan. And I'm going to gracefully not answer questions myself um, because this is not my area of expertise. But uh, let's dive into this, guys. So um, I saw the, the first question that came in actually, I think was, was a really good one. Um, and basically, it's how can I use a CRM that we're already using within our company to determine traits or characteristics of your best customers, right? So what kinds of signals can you pick up of the people who are already customers to say, okay, these are the kinds of things we should look for in our prospects as well. So we're doing this right now. So I could speak to this. Um, so the more rich of a profile that you have on the people that buy from you and the accounts that those people work for, the better off you are. Um, you know, very simply, here's an example. Uh, we know that our customers traditionally have inside sales professionals, right? And we're able to track because ZoomInfo gives us information on how many inside sales reps there are per account. And so what we've actually been going through right now is attributing revenue from salesforce.com tied to accounts that we've won. And we even get so, you know, clever to figure out which leads are attributed to marketing generated, which ones are outbound prospected. And we've just done a whole model planning for 2019 about potentially what territories are yielding what revenue, right? And we're still building a story. We're still figuring out what it means, but we have the insights within a day and a half. And I'm a sales rep who is an English major, does not have an MBA. I'm not a mathematician, but I was able to put together a model that at least had a story that said, here's where our revenue comes from. Here's the types of companies that that revenue comes from. And further, if I wanted to, I could say, here's the type of people that buy our product from those types of companies because on that profile, I have their job title from their email signature, I have their management level, I have their job function. Um, you know, the CRM is the repository of the data, but using Salesforce and, uh, and Close.io and others to run reports out of the CRM, you're able to make sense of what types of accounts, what types of people are attributing to what types of revenue. Yeah, like that it turns into something actionable. Brennan, do you guys do anything on this front? We do, yeah. So we actually do a lot, uh, both pre-lead and, and post. So one thing we do is we look at uh, behavioral signals. So what website referred them. So if they came from a, um, a review site or something, we know they're probably, you know, price comparing or, or shopping around. Um, and we enrich the generated lead with that info. So when say somebody comes from Captera, they book a demo, we go into that demo assuming they were, you know, they're, they're competition aware potentially. Whereas if somebody comes after Googling around and landing on a, an, an article on our blog that's about something like, how do I get more people uh, you know, to, to buy from my e-commerce website or something like that, or something e-commerce focused, 
if they then go and they end up opting in or becoming a lead, we'll then do the same thing. We, we basically enrich their new profile with, hey, they're probably in e-commerce. And again, like Will was saying, we don't use that as confirmation that they're in e-commerce, but it's a good way to kind of start a conversation or to kind of have, like you said, that chip um, or that, like, you know, that, that ace in, in your deck, right? Of like knowing that that's, if you use language, um, you, maybe you give examples of people that are in a similar space, um, that's going to be helpful. So we do that. We also do for when we don't have uh, signals like that being sent, say it's direct traffic, we have a tool called Write Ask, which lets um, people basically profile themselves on our website. We ask questions like, what, e what uh, email marketing app or CRM do you use? What type of uh, business do you run or do you work for? And then all that data, if they're anonymous, will get sent up once they become a lead. And if they're already a lead, because we do send our list, every time we email our list, there's links back to our site. We do this progressive profiling that over time makes it so the data we have about them is more enriched and that's direct. That's them saying, this is me, this is me. So that's definitely a lot more uh, confirmed, if you will, than softer signals like they came from a, you know, an e-commerce blog that reviews us. They're probably an e-commerce company. Um, so we do that. We do a lot with uh, trigger links. So uh, we mostly do that through our email marketing app, but you know, they click, uh, they click a certain link that self profiles them. We then sync that data into, uh, into close. So we do use close as our CRM. And now, um, we've got that in their, in their, uh, lead record. Um, so we do a lot of that. We do as much as we can around behavior. So the types of websites setting up traffic, the ad they click on, who is this ad targeting? What did the ad say? And the idea is either automa automatically through, you know, email marketing, or individually through a sales discussion, leveraging that data to make it so we can be more relevant to them when we, uh, when we communicate with them. I like the idea too here of letting people self-select, right? So whether it's like right ask or a trigger link in an email, like doing progressive profiling so that you're building a better picture of who these people are too as time goes on. So I mean, I'd imagine it, it changes and organizations grow and evolve as well. Yeah, we get about a 30% um, uh, engagement rate uh, kind of across the board with people self-segmenting like that. So it is, I mean, you're not going to get total info, right? But it, it does help. And those people engaging are more likely the ones who are going to buy from you anyway, potentially. So, yeah. yeah. So guys, um, the next question we've got, we've gotten in a couple of various different forms really. Um, but basically the, the summation here is, you know, I'm the only sales or marketing person um, at my company. Um, I've been doing a lot of sort of one by one email collection or data collection. Um, what's kind of the first place that most startups or SMBs should be starting if they want to go from this very manual, I'm the person doing everything, um, to sort of building data on their prospects more at scale? I mean, I, I think that's, we, we've talked a lot about it today. I think you have to be comfortable taking calculated risks and taking actions and make a hypothesis and go test it. Right. Um, I, I talk to companies every single day that tell me, well, I'm a startup and you know, we're lean and we don't have a lot of budget and we haven't really planned this the right way. And we don't know if we could even really handle, but then I look at their website and it's beautifully designed. It has calls to action all over the place. They're segmenting me on a journey. The minute I click something, I want to stay on the website. And so I'm kind of like, you kind of have this beautiful song to sing to the world and you're afraid to sing it, right? Like you got to get up on the stage and sing, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think whether you're a one person marketing team or a one person sales team, if you work for the company that you work for, you have consciously decided and whether you like it or not at this point to go and evangelize that message to the world. And you have an obligation, you know, some old school sales and marketing leaders will say, we pay you a salary <laughs> to do that, right? And, and maybe you don't get paid a salary yet, but you're getting a bonus or something. Um, and I think that's where I can only encourage folks. I'm not going to break your workflow. I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. But if you have something in place and your value is something that can be delivered to the world, that one person marketing team should say, I take pride in what I do and I should go reach out to the world. Or that one person inside sales team I've been there. I worked in a five by five cubicle in Austin, Texas, and I moved down there and didn't know anything about my marketplace, but darn it, I picked up the phone and started calling people and I fell on my face and I figured out why. And then I fixed and rinsed, rushed, repeated, and we built a $3 million business in 12 months. 
you know, but we did it because we acted. We didn't sit there and think for months about how we could go to market and engage only the right exact person the first time. Um, I would, I would love to give you a big data hug if you're one of those companies. So that's my whole territory. Those are the people I love to work with every day. Um, and you know, it's, it's an exciting thing. It's not a, it's a scary thing, but it's also an exciting thing and it should be embraced the same way a fortune 100 company is looking at this type of stuff. Brennan, anything to weigh in on that one? Yeah. I mean, up until recently, I was a, you know, one man marketing development design business owning team. <laughs> and I, uh, I, th I think the, I think what a lot of small companies and even bigger companies run into is not having a concrete understanding of, well, who are, who are the different segments that I could, I could profile off of, right? Like who are the different types of people who could buy from us? So one of the things that I would recommend is if you have any sort of autoresponder that happens, say when they become a lead or something like that, or maybe this is just something as you communicate with people, say over the phone, ask them, you know, who are you and what are you, what drew you here? Like what specifically you filled out a lead form? Like, why did you fill that out? What are you hoping I can help you with? And over time you can normalize all the feedback you're getting into discrete segments. So you can start seeing, okay, I've got a lot of people who are this profile or that profile or whatever, who are, you know, demographically or firmographically identify as such. And then these are the, kind of common needs, kind of issues people keep coming to us with. And then over time, you can start to think, well, how can I automatically profile people? You know, right now you're just getting raw responses back, say over the phone or as a reply to your emails. But what can you do over time to let people either self-segment or behaviorally segment as such once you have an idea of what these different segments are? Because like what was saying, you know, people, people don't want to mess around with trying to figure out how can you help me? So the more specific you can be, the more direct you can be, the better. And one way of doing that, I think, is to say, like, one of the things that's worked best for me is I have email courses that lead to, to uh, products. Ask people, why did you join this email course? Who are you and what do you want? And what are you hoping it'll help you do? And then by the time they get pitched on that uh, product, reuse that data and say, look, you know, if, this, if you have this issue, that's the headline that increases engagement that gets them to keep scrolling on the sales page. And ultimately they get, they're more likely to get to that buy now button once they've, uh, once they see, okay, this, this company, this person, this business uh, gets me. So I think um, starting out, best thing you can do is just collect a lot of raw data and then uh, work on normalizing that into actual buckets or segments or whatever you want to call them. Uh, over time and then starting to, you know, finding ways of acting on that, whether it be through just your, your, you know, contacting people over the phone or, or in a way that scales. Yeah, I like that. I think the, the emphasis being on simple first is also really important to highlight for people. So not like trying to dive straight into the deep end here and collect everything and then do nothing with all this data you have. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So you guys, um, this next question goes a little bit into the weeds, but I think it's a really important one, especially for people that are scaling up their outreach. So um, this one, Will, was actually directed at you. Um, when you encourage people to do trial and error, right, how do you make sure to protect your domain reputation and avoid getting all your emails marked as spam once you start to scale up your outreach? Sure, no, that's a great question. Um, first of all, Make sure whatever email automation tool or sales automation tool um, or anything that you're sending a lot of emails through uh, has a dedicated email server for you. That is the most common trap that people fall into is they start using a, a solution that doesn't have an, a dedicated email server and you're kind of hindered by what other people are doing no matter how hard you work. Um, so that's number one. Our smartest customers have you know, invested in things like Marketo and Eloqua and HubSpot and you know, to a certain extent, other email automation solutions, also the sales forces, or excuse me, the sales lofts, the outreaches, those types of things. Um, number two is be intelligent about how many people per account that you're attacking at the same time. Okay. Not only is it embarrassing to your brand if you send the same email to 10 different people that sit all around the table from each other, <laughs> um, but it's extremely, it, it hinders your deliverability, right? If I'm sending inquiries to the same email domain, uh, all at the same time, even sometimes within the same week, two weeks, um, that starts to flag you and the, the spam catchers will start to say, you know, I, I don't think that email domain is actually sent with best intentions. Um, and, and I think that's where data, once again, when you're being tactical and you're being calculated, 
you can't just take a lead list and send a bunch of messages because you have to understand how many accounts am I working? How many contacts per account? Am I reaching out to the exact titles at each account that I want to reach out to? Am I getting a little smarter and tactical? Do I reach out to the non-manager people today, the manager people tomorrow, and once enough of them engage, do I start calling the VPs, right? And how do I know who I'm calling? So I could go down into that rabbit hole, but I think from the, the question, you know, as long as you have a dedicated email server and as long as you're pretty calculated about how many people you're reaching out to at each organization concurrently, you should be just fine. Um, the, the, the most important thing is you have to make sure that that data that you're relying on is not static and decayed. <laughs> and you know, any list that you buy that's already been put together is depreciated value. It's an asset that's already been walked off the lot, if you will, by somebody else. So you have to make sure you're relying on dynamically refreshed data. Again, you know, shameful plug here is, you know, that's, that's what our data set does for our customers is they download on demand so they don't have to worry about it being a static set, right? So those three things I would recommend. It's a great data question. Data integrity. Mm -hmm. So you guys, um, we got another question here. We've got a few more minutes. Um, uh, basically the question from Sultan here is uh, when I have clients in a bunch of different segments, so he's mentioning defense, IT, e-commerce, telecom, like very broad segments of customers here. Um, but he's seeing that most often he's selling to small and mid-sized companies that actually purchase, but he wants to move up the chain and go to more of an enterprise kind of client for his business. So what do you guys recommend in terms of sort of positioning yourself to make the leap from selling to SMBs up to larger enterprise organizations? What, what needs to change, I guess, as a starting point? I, I think that the thing is though, is to remember, cause we're also segmented that way. Um, in our experience, the difference between an enterprise scale company and an SMB company is more about how they purchase you. <laughs> yeah. um, it really doesn't matter so much about what, how you position your value. Um, every company should have some end state goal that they can't do today because you're, they're not using your solution, right? Whether you're a fortune 100 company, our, our new CEO went to work for IBM and he took over Watson, which was a very successful, fast growing entity. And they said, you're in charge to make this double in revenue, right? So we're already doing what most startups only dream of doing. You need to double it and not, not in three years, you know, tomorrow and, and scale it out. And he was able to do that in you know, only a couple of years. Um, that's what I've found is that again, hypothesizing, experimenting and measuring results is usually the best way to figure out what's working vertical wise. Um, running a kick to YouTube, but I, I have found that whether I'm talking to a five person company or I'm talking to the largest organization that ZoomInfo supports, everybody has some desired state that they cannot be at for some hurdle or reason. And you should be solving that problem in a different way for everybody, but it shouldn't be that SMBs have different problems than enterprise do, right? It's they all should have a, a desired end state that they can't get to because they don't have your solution yet. Um, yeah. Grant, I don't know if you feel differently about that. I mean, the only, yeah, the only thing that I've really seen, I, I agree in that it, it's really a matter of the, uh, you know, basically the, the, the purchasing, um, you know, does it go through, um, they need to issue RFPs and all these, you know, all this different, like the procurement process changes. If it's a decision maker who is the business owner of a small company, the buying cycle is going to be much different than if it's if they need to go through different departments and so on. Um, I would say the only other thing that I've noticed is smaller companies, especially when the person making the buying decision also is the one who is uh, has his or her hands attached to the revenue of the company, is that um, I found that ROI, for instance, as a uh, as a focus, tends to work better with smaller companies than enterprises because a lot of enterprises, really, I mean the the person that you're selling to in a certain department you're so far removed potentially from anything uh revenue focused that um what actually i found especially when selling consulting appeals to them better is making them look better internally versus potentially making their business more successful so strange thing but i've ha i've been able to sell bigger companies more enterprise companies like fortune 500s better by focusing more on how can I make you and your department really look great internally. I mean, I don't say that overtly, but that's kind of the underlying theme versus, you know, concrete financial ROIs or something. So I think a lot of it is just really get to the root of why is somebody even interested in what you have to offer 
and really finding ways of responding to that. And that's, a, I mean, that's a skill in its own right, being able to kind of read between the lines and figure that out. But um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is the procurement process is much different for enterprises versus SMBs. Um, but there's also uh, kind of their, the, the underlying motivation I think uh, can, can change too. And, and tying it to data too, you, if you measure where your wins are, Sultan, if you measure where your wins are, you don't have to change it, right? If, if you can find more people that look like your wins, that's how you scale. And then you go attack other segments as the market starts to respond to you. So if you know you kill it with SMB companies, go kill it with more SMB companies before you try and abandon what you're really good at. And then as you scale up and get so big, then you have the ability to go take calculated risks to go attack new, new enterprise. And that's where data helps. If I say I do really well with an SMB company in the, uh, let's say, e-commerce sector, I need to find more e-commerce sector companies with SMB. Um, yeah. And that's where solutions like Info or competitors, they'll help you uncover those new accounts and those people to reach out to tomorrow, right? Beautiful. All right, there's awesome advice to wrap up on, guys. Thank you again for joining us. Um, for everyone today, we're going to be sending out the recording here shortly so you can share it with other people. Team. Uh, but yeah, then, Will, thank you guys for joining us. All right, thank you. See you all. Bye bye.